G'day, Harry from the Wet Mules here, uh, in the shed on a cold rainy day in Adelaide. And uh, today I thought I'd bring you a bit of a discussion about the twin Megalodon rebreather that Craig and I and Dave Hurst and probably others around the world have also been utilising for deep or long exposure diving. The other day on deep discussions and shallow thoughts, and there's a fair bit of discussion, fair bit of discussion about this rebreather on that forum. Uh, and I would recommend you have a, have a watch of that interview. Craig made some good points about why, where and when you might bring out the twin rebreather because it's not something you want to undertake lightly. It certainly has some problems associated and it's an absolute nightmare to put together and to dive as well. So uh, having, having started with that suggestion that actually it's not a great track path to go down, I'll get into talking about the rebreather itself. I think that's the beauty of cave diving is that everything we do um, requires specialised techniques and there's no one fit for all, all dives or all caves and the beauty of cave diving for me is that you have to invent some of your own gear to be able to adequately and safely explore the places we want to go. And that is why we've come up with this solution for in particular the Pierce resurgence for the, the ultra deep diving there to give us that extra safety and redundancy that we need to be able to do uh, prolonged exposures in very deep water. But we've used this also in deep caves in Thailand. Uh, we dive Song Hong Cave with Ben Raymond, it's to 196 metres. Uh, we've used it in China in Dajing Spring to about 213 metres. And of course the Pierce most recently to 245 metres. So the weapon we've chosen is the, the Megalodon rebreather and we've twinned it up. And Craig Challen uh, has to take the credit for first coming up with this concept, uh, at least in our group, and putting it together. I know there are other people around the world who have done the same thing. And so we'll get, get started and have a bit of a look at the rebreather itself. So first thing you do is just pop down the shop and buy two Megalodons. And um, you just simply put them together with twin bands, the same way you would put two cylinders together. And that's kind of the end of the easy part, to be honest. The right side is my primary rebreather. That's uh, the primary loop, which I breathe off pretty much for the whole dive, but intermittently, intermittently go on to the other loop to, to test that it's still working. And the other can, which was my original rebreather, is, is the secondary or backup loop. I bought this one secondhand off my friend Brian Kaycook, actually, in the Bahamas. So um, had the head overhauled and serviced because uh, Brian uh, does a lot of diving and his gear gets pretty pretty worn out so we gave it a bit of a refurbishment and it's been fantastic since then. In this instance the two cylinders that you can see uh, not obviously the way you would normally configure a rebreather. The one on the right is my, my dry suit gas and the one on the left is the diluent for the secondary or bailout rebreather. So I'll turn it around and uh, get into a bit more detail. So to finish the discussion for the, the easy parts of the rebreather, the wing I've got is just a, a standard wing from Gollum Gear. That's pretty much, as I say, the end of the standard parts of the rebreather. So the primary loop, um, which is the, uh, the, the loop coming from now what's on your left hand side, comes from uh, the top of the can in the normal way and feeds the standard front mounted counter lungs here. Um, so the inhale counter lung on the right, which I've got my manual oxygen injection fed into, and the standard exhale counter lung on the left, which I've modified by adding a second stage style uh, automatic diluent valve ADV with a shut off on there. Never put a shut off on your bailout loop because you don't want the loop to implode itself during descent, so you must always have um, uh, gas available to the secondary loop. But I do like to have a shut off on my ADV on the primary loop so that on deco I can switch that off and not accidentally trigger uh, diluent, which is very hypoxic diluent in our case, uh, into the loop. The um, manual add for the diluent is connected in this case because at great depth, just in case there's any resistance breathing on the ADV, I want to be able to add diluent to fill up the loop uh, manually as well. You don't want to be doing anything that causes uh, respiratory work, and if that means sucking on, a, on an ADV, then that's not a good thing to be doing. That's one of the reasons I've gotten rid of that piston-style ADV off the MEG, because I do find at depth there's a bit of work to uh, activate it. Now the secondary loop, um, which is the one on the outside that you can see, which is coming from the loop on your right hand side, 
supplies some, um, uh, the counter lungs are subgravity back mounted counter lungs and they sit between the wing and uh, the, uh, the plate that bolts the whole thing together, uh, which is just a standard stainless steel back plate inside there. Um, so those back mounted counter lungs are, are a single unit that look a bit like a wing and they're sandwiched between the wing at the back and that stainless steel back plate. Now getting all this to fit together and having space to get yourself into the inside takes a, a lot of experimentation. Um, so on the inhale side, uh, this, there's a T-piece that is supplied by subgravity. Um, that has a, a port in the side for which you can add a manual oxygen injection, which is required. Um, and obviously the electronics are still driving the, the rebreather, but I have that set to manual during the dive so that the, um, the oxygen content falls to the PO2 of the diluent that's being added, unless it drops below that safety uh, zone of 0.19 in the meg, in which case the solenoid will fire. So you've always got a breathable gas, in theory, in that loop when you change over to it, uh, but you may need to top it up fairly smartly with the manual add. On the exhale side, um, I'm using the, um, the IQ sub ADV, which is another diaphragm style easy to activate ADV. And as I mentioned before, very important that you don't have a shut off on that ADV, that must be able to trigger. And if you accidentally leave that shut off uh, obstructed, then obviously that, that diaphragm is going to implode and flood the rebreather uh, during descent. So it's an important thing to remember. Now both of the loops come together at this point in the twin BOV, uh, which is something that we've discussed a little bit before. Um, we feel that this twin bob is a really important safety feature of the unit and it is essentially homemade. The first one was made by Jacob from Gollum Gear as a, um, a prototype and, and Craig managed to grab hold of that. Um, subsequently we've, we've made our own and basically it's a, a new modern shrimp and one of the early old shrimps uh, machined and fitted together. And um, basically it gives you a variety of options in terms of which loop or open circuit you can, you can breathe during the dive. So when you start the dive, um, we would normally have the, um, obviously you put the, the loop in your mouth, turn on the primary loop, so you're just breathing on the primary loop. If you turn that off, uh, then you default to the uh, second stage regulator, so you've got a bailout valve. Now it's important to remember that on the surface, in our case we're breathing 4% oxygen 90% helium uh, for these deep dives. So that's not something you want to be able to breathe uh, on the surface until you get down to uh, a decent depth. Um, so you have to be very careful of that. Now the second uh, uh, loop, so let's say you're on the first loop and you're diving and if you want to check the um, second loop, basically you have that in the open position. So that's open to the second loop and Currently we're breathing off the first loop. If you crack that, then gas will equalise between the two loops and you're now breathing off the second loop. If you want to go to uh, open circuit bailout, you then switch it that way, the bottom one. So we would normally start the dive with, uh, after putting the mouthpiece in, having the second loop open, diving on the first loop, and then every 20 or 30 metres, you actually only really need to feather the valve on the first on the first loop just to equalize the pressure between the two loops and occasionally also open it up completely so that you actually breathe off the loop for a few breaths and test that it's uh, intact and in particular that it's not flooded. And that's very reassuring to be able to do that uh, during the descent rather than stopping and physically you know closing your first mouthpiece, taking it out of your mouth, putting the second mouthpiece in, opening it breathing off that loop, exhaling any water out of the mouthpiece, closing it, getting rid of it, putting the second mouthpiece in, opening that mouthpiece. The chance of making a mistake during that kind of four stage process is quite high and particularly if you're in a genuine bailout situation. I think the chances of flooding one of those loops during that uh, exchange is quite high. So we think that although there is in theory a single point of failure in this mouthpiece, if you if you've got a split in there or that pulled off, um, that would be fairly disastrous. 
I guess you'd be motivated to breathe off the hard plastic part of the bailout valve there for a while. Um, but um, we feel that the, the safety benefits of this twin bulb are very significant. Uh, we make sure we always have very high quality silicon, uh, fairly new flapper valves inside because there's definitely uh, a theoretical uh, point of resistance inside these bailout valves and probably the highest point of resistance within the whole loop. Uh, so it's important to, to maintain those well. But we've found the um, subjective work of breathing on this rebreather pretty good at, at depth. In terms of gas supplies, uh, on the oxygen side, I'm using a 40 cubic foot aluminium cylinder for oxygen, and that has a Y valve on it, which has two separate regulators, obviously. And uh, they are supplied through quick disconnects into the offboard connections on the rebreather. Uh, QC6 on one and a QC4 on the others only because I didn't have two of the same fitting when I put it all together. Uh, you'll see the number of hoses and, and connections on this rebreather mean that you're doing a lot of orders to um, MyFlex or hose suppliers or um, swage lock and so forth. So um, that seems to provide redundant oxygen supplies to both the rebreathers. On the other side, uh, a single source of diluent from um, a 11.8 litre aluminium cylinder through a QC6 supplies diluent to the main rebreather, the primary loop, uh, also, to the, um, also to the bailout valve. Uh, the wing is supplied from the uh, secondary um, secondary, off, uh, secondary onboard diluent, which obviously supplies diluent to the uh, bailout rebreather. And finally, dry suit inflation is from this cylinder on this side, which has its own regulator. So as far as possible, trying not to put all our eggs in one basket. You know, we've got uh, separate sources of um, buoyancy with dry suit and wing, separate diluent for the bailout rebreather separate diluent for the main rebreather and the bailout valve and separate sources of oxygen. But at the same time, minimising the number of cylinders that we're carrying so that uh, as far as possible, they are, uh, you are as streamlined as possible. We try and keep everything as simple as far as that is possible with such a complex rig because every extra cylinder you're carrying is a, is an, a, 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 you know, a catchment point, an entanglement point and so that's something we really want to try very hard to avoid. So that's gas supplies. Um, I've got an Omni, Omni Swivel Quick Disconnect on my bailout valve, and I also have a shutoff valve on, on this as well because uh, there's nothing more annoying that, you know, you're halfway into the dive, 150 metres, and your second stage starts bubbling. So I do like to have the option of just shutting that off uh, in case the bubbling starts to become, you know, an annoying or concerning. Uh, ideally, everything would be perfectly maintained and never, you'd never have any problems, but, you know, in uh, field conditions on remote expeditions, you know, problems arise and it can arise in the middle of the dive. And you have to decide whether you're going to abort the dive based on a small problem like that or not. Uh, so that's gas supplies. And the final thing to discuss is, is monitoring. Um, now, I've had the primary loop modified somewhat in that I've had the secondary display removed from it and I've had a Fisher connector put onto it and that supplies this uh, Nerd 2 which is fantastic but it still retains its uh, original Megalodon HUD uh, which is just tucked under a bit of bungee just in front of the, um, the twin bov and the same applies to the HUD on the secondary loop on the other side and again that's just kept out of the way out of my vision so I'm not distracted by it. But if I did have to bail out onto the secondary loop at any stage, I can just push that HUD up and, and be able to see it quite easily. And I practice that uh, fairly frequently. Um, and I can make sure that I've got a breathable gas until I've got time to get organized and get a handset out and have a proper look at it. Uh, at that point, I'd also have to change the handset from manual to a set point that I wanted to continue the, the ascent with. Um, so in terms of the handset, um, I'm just left with the uh, backup secondary on this side, as well as the backup HUD. And on this side, I've actually got the two primary handsets 
kind of stuck together and all these handsets are clipped off at my side. I don't like having anything on my arms, any extra cables floating around that might get hooked on something. Um, I've got enough computers on my arms and so forth without having extra handsets as well. And the other problem I'm finding with these liquid crystal display uh, old Apex handsets is I really struggle to read them now. I've got reading glasses in the bottom of my mask, but even with the backlights on, I need to be able to hold them straight out in front of me and I can't quite do that with, with them on my arms. Um, so that's partly a problem with aging eyesight, but also the amount of stuff we've got underneath our dry suit makes it incredibly restrictive and difficult to um, maneuver. You know, we've got so many layers on and a big neoprene thick dry suit for this six degree water um, that I just can't get the handset in front of my eyes to look at it properly. So I rely on these displays on and around the bailout valve uh, until I can get one of these handsets deployed and have a good look at it then. Um, the Nerd 2 has been fantastic. I haven't had any problems on it on this recent dive to 245 meters. Um, I have had problems with the Fisher connector on the old Nerds and on other um, uh, wrist mounted uh, handsets on deep dives. So on a uh, 195 meter dive, a 150 meter dive in the ocean and a 230 meter dive uh, on three of, so that's three dives I've had a failure which I've put down to the, the Fisher cable, which has meant that the display or the nerd has frozen onto a high PO2 with all the cells reading the same thing. Um, since I've had the Nerd 2 and a newer Fisher connector, that hasn't been a problem. But I guess the, the bottom line is the Fishers are not ideal and they're not really designed for this kind of work. And uh, I'd very much like to get a, uh, a set of the new Mega Electronics, perhaps with the, um, the Shearwater Electronics, so that A, I can read the displays because I don't have so much trouble with those beautiful OLED coloured displays and also to get the new CAN bus wet connecting system which would get rid of all these problems. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, in terms of attaching other things to us, um, I've just got a normal sort of uh, uh, tail from Gollum with the, you know, the old armadillo style beaver tail with the two door handles on it for clipping the base of my tanks off. I've got D-rings hidden behind the counter lungs which I can clip the tops off and I also have a bungee system on the side. Uh, it really depends what, what I'm wearing. If you're just in a wetsuit, everything's easy. You can clip stuff off yourself, use the bungees, no problems. If you're in this very uh, heavy cold water gear with uh, dry gloves on, you really need someone to help you get into this and it's a real struggle. But in a wetsuit, I can get in and out of it all by myself and put things on pretty well. Uh, in the dry suit, not so much. So that's a quick overview of the Twin Meg as I see it. As I say, Craig and Dave Hurst, my regular diving buddies with the same sort of setup have got quite different configurations. We all argue over uh, uh, a beer in the evenings who's got the best setup, but for me this has been working really well.